My name is Ruth Langer, and I'm professor of Jewish studies in the theology department and interim director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. On behalf, on behalf of the center and its associate director, Dr. Camille Markey, sitting in the back, I'm honored to welcome both our in-person, very welcome in-person guests. We're still thrilled to be having real faces in front of us and not just Zoom screens but also our Zoom webinar audience, which I can assure you is even larger. I also want to give a warm thanks to our co-sponsors for this event, Boston College's Office of Campus Ministry, the Jewish Studies Program, and Hillel. This event is being recorded and will be available soon through our website and YouTube channel, so please spread the word for those who aren't able to make it. There will also be time for questions after the talk. Those of you who are here in person know what to do. We will have a mobile mic to pass around. And those of you on Zoom, please post your questions in the chat directed to the panelists, and Dr. Markey and I will relay them to the speaker. Before we turn to today's speaker, let's take a few minutes to be mindful of today's date. <coughs> November 9th the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht, the Reichspogrom that in retrospect signaled the looming Shoah. Professor John Mahalchik, director of BC's film studies program and co-director of its Jewish studies program, unfortunately is teaching right now, but he graciously shared with us a brief film and this introduction to it. 83 years ago, on November 9th, 1938, Nazis desecrated and destroyed synagogues and Jewish businesses throughout Germany. On October 27th, 2018, a gunman murdered 11 Jews who were worshiping at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh's Squirrel Hill neighborhood, the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. That deadly pogrom against the Jewish community of Germany, Austria, and parts of Czechoslovakia on November 9th to 10th, 1938, had deep roots in the anti-Semitic history of the Third Reich. A few years after the passage of the infamous 1935 Nuremberg laws barred Jews from citizenship in Germany, Germany in March 1938, three years later, less than three years later, annexed Austria. Many Jews from Germany and the annexed areas were expelled from their homes and forced to move back to within the borders of Poland. Such was the situation of the Greenspan family, now expelled from Germany, where they had been established for decades. In Paris, their 17-year-old son, Herschel, decided to take revenge for the family's plight. He entered the German embassy with the intention of assassinating the German ambassador to France. Not finding him at the embassy, Herschel instead mortally wounded a German diplomat, Ernst von Rath. Prime Pro Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels seized upon this assassination as an excuse to launch a planned pogrom against the Jews. Viewing Herschel's act as an example of a plot by international Jewry, Goebbels took action, disguised, however, as a spontaneous uprising to protest the von Rath assassination. Professor Halchik's short film illustrates the results of Kristallnacht, a prelude to the Shoah. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The organized pogrom against the Jews of Germany and Austria revealed to the world that beyond the legal action against the Jews, now violence would be necessary to eliminate the Jewish presence. Kristallnacht is a, a dramatic turning point. I mean, the German people, they, it frightened them. Kristallnacht frightened many Germans because they had never seen violence on that scale.
It's very easy to feel that such events would never happen today, and certainly not in America. But recent years have seen attacks on American minorities, against churches of the African American community, and also explicitly anti-Semitic attacks on synagogues. Today's program focuses on a shooting that occurred three years ago in my hometown, in Pittsburgh, in the neighborhood in which I grew up, Squirrel Hill, at a synagogue a few blocks from the childhood homes of my parents and our speaker's father. Our speaker today is Dr. Mark Oppenheimer, a former Corcoran visiting chair here in the Center for Christian Jewish Learning, and we welcome him back most warmly. Dr. Oppenheimer directs the Yale Journalism Initiative. He received his BA in history and his PhD in religious studies from Yale. He also served as a religious columnist for the New York Times from 2010 to 2016 and has written for the New York Times Magazine, GQ, The Washington Post, Slate, Mother Jones, The Nation, The Believer, among others. He has been a commentator on NPR and is also the host of the Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox. He's the author of five books, including the newish Jewish encyclopedia, and aside from the book that he's talking about tonight, two other books which are also available for sale on the table in the back. His latest book, tonight's topic, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Shooting and the Soul of a Neighborhood, is a compelling investigation, and I say compelling because I've just read it, uh, into the dynamics of the response of this American community, both Jews and their Christian neighbors, to this tragedy of now three years ago. Mark. Many thanks to Professor Langer and to all of you for turning out. I'm really, really grateful to see everyone. And I just want to make sure that my slides are working, so I'll take care of that. And then, yep. And yep. And great. Um, so thank you. It's very good to be back here in Newton. And um, as I, w I had a wonderful year here about uh, I think it was six or seven years ago. I'm trying to remember which of my children was very little. I'm trying to remember which child I felt guilty about leaving when I came to, to teach here. Um, and, uh, but it was a wonderful uh, year here as the Cork and Fell. It's good to be back. Um, a more recent memory of my time in Newton. No, I like that as my theme music. That was good. Um, it's very dramatic. Um, a more recent memory is that it was actually, I realized this as I was, as I was sitting here just a few minutes ago, that uh, it was three years ago on October 27th, 2018, when uh, the Tree of Life shooting was happening, I was here in Newton, two hours from my home in New Haven. I had taken my daughter, Rebecca, to the bat mitzvah of a summer camp friend of hers from Camp Ramah, and uh, it was at Temple Emanuel here in Newton, and that's where I was. And I remember very, very well being, <coughs> we were in synagogue all morning, we got there around 9.30, fairly early in the day for, for a bar bat mitzvah. We were not fashionably late, we got there early, and we were there for the whole service of, of two B'nai Mitzvah because they doubled up that weekend. And then there was a luncheon afterwards. And the whole time, everyone was just, you know, eating their bagels and lox and, you know, it, it, having a good time. And we got back out to my car and we left our phones in the car. And then I did open my phone to see what was up. And I had screen after screen of text messages. And they all had something to do with Pittsburgh. You know, are you going to Pittsburgh? Do you know anyone in Pittsburgh? What's the deal with Pittsburgh? And I remember thinking to myself, I've had a cell phone since about you know, 2000, and I've never gotten a text about Pittsburgh. And now all of a sudden, everyone's texting me about Pittsburgh. What on earth is going on? So I navigated over to one of my news apps, and I saw, I began reading about what had happened. And um, I must have looked quite stricken, because Rebecca, who was in the pastor seat next to me, said, Dad, what's going on? And I said, there's been a shooting of Jews in Squirrel Hill. And she said to me, Dad, Squirrel Hill, isn't that where we're from? And I said, well, in a sense, yes. Um, because although I'm from Western Massachusetts and my daughter is uh, New Haven born and bred, 
uh, she knew. She knew the family lore. She knew that that my father, um, that we were in fact the first Oppenheimers not to be from Squirrel, not to be from Pittsburgh, and that that uh, that as long as there had been Oppenheimers in America, they were Pittsburghers. And for the past three generations, as long as Squirrel Hill had been settled, because it wasn't really settled until the beginning of the 20th century, they were in Squirrel Hill. So. Right there, this felt um, extremely personal, not personal in the way it felt personal to the people who lived it, and I always want to be very clear about that, that I was, uh, like any good journalist, I was an interloper and a carpetbagger, uh, not, not a native. Um, but, but personal nonetheless. It felt that, that I had a, a, a stake beyond the usual stake that I have in my stories. And I realized pretty quickly that, um, that I wanted to write something about what had happened. But I did not want to write about the killer, even though the best book ever about a mass killing in America, Columbine by Dave Cullen, is principally about the two killers in Columbine, is about the shooters. And I revere that book, but it was not the kind of book I wanted to write. The idea of spending a year or two or three inside the, the far anti-Semitic, xenophobic, white supremacist swamps of the internet trying to understand where the killer got his ideology did not strike me as an appealing way to spend my finite time on Earth. Um, nor, in fact, did I want to write a book about the victims, though um, all of them were, you know, surely righteous souls, each of whom deserves a book of their own. I was much more interested in the neighborhood because I knew from personal family history, but also from my studies, that this was um, a, a unique Jewish neighborhood, um, quite rare in the annals of American history for having had a substantial Jewish minority for its entire existence, for about a century exactly, since it was settled around the time of World War I for having had a remarkably stable Jewish presence, and also for having had a remarkably diverse Jewish presence. That is to say, it has had orthodox, conservative, reform, secular, renewal, reconstructors, every kind of Jew. Uh, Squirrel Hill is the kind of center for them in Pittsburgh, which is not necessarily the rule in American Jewry, as I think many of us probably know. So, But I was very curious about what it would mean for the worst thing that could happen to a Jewish community to happen to one of the best Jewish communities, like what would happen when it came to a neighborhood that had certain resources that perhaps Parkland or Columbine or Aurora or near, nearer my home in Connecticut, Sandy Hook, didn't necessarily have certain resources of, of, of school and shul and, and you know, walkability and density and certain kind of urban advantages. So to me, the neighborhood was always the protagonist. And I began traveling to Pittsburgh the month after the, it, the shooting, two or three weeks after the shooting, sometime in November of 2018. And I ended up going 32 times over a year and a half. Um, and the, my last flight home from Pittsburgh was, was in March of 2020, just as COVID was descending across the land. And that was, that was purely coincidental. I had told my wife several months earlier, as I was buying some particularly cheap fares out of Logan, in fact, I think I'll buy a bunch of these. The last one will be in mid-March, and that'll be the end of my reporting because by that point I had left home enough. And I also, at some point, with, when you're researching, you have to stop researching and start writing. So I had said in December, mid-March, I'll be done. And as it happened, mid-March, I had to be done. And on my last flight back, I think I was one of three people on the flight. I mean, it was one of the last flights. So um, you know, I got out, got out just in time. Um, the book I wrote really is a patchwork of, it's a sort of panoramic, kaleidoscopic look at Squirrel Hill from the point of view of clergy, Jews, non-Jews, Hala bakers, um, trauma therapists, trauma dogs, uh, human, animal, everything, um, over the course of a year. And I want to I want to give you a sense of it in two ways. First, I'm going to read one short passage. Then I want to show you a whole bunch of photographs from the book because I was very insistent against my publisher's wishes because photographs are expensive. That um, that it have a lot of photographs um, and they're about sixty because as much as I thought that I can paint pictures with my words. I can't really paint pictures with my words. So I thought we should have some actual pictures. And then I want to read, a, so I'm going to show you a bunch of the pictures from the book to give you a sense of what it is. And then, and also what, what happened in that year and kind of what the argument of the book is through these pictures. And then I want to read another passage. Um, the first passage is, um, is about a woman named Tammy Hepps, who is, um, she's originally from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, but she's lived in Pittsburgh for a number of years doing family genealogical research. She had family in Homestead, just across the river from Pittsburgh, an old steel town. And um, she's, she moved there about seven, eight years ago and, and has become kind of a, an important local macher. She's like, you know, very active in shuls and, and other Jewish societies. And she spent the day, the 48 hours after the shooting, kind of wandering around Squirrel Hill being useful. She said to Hillam, she said Psalms outside of Tree of Life. She went to the JCC and consoled someone she knew who had just been widowed, who had lost her husband in the shooting. She helped author a letter that uh, the 
liberal Jewish group, Ben the Ark, wrote to President Trump asking him not to come. Um, she did like all these things and then she finally was walking home on Sunday uh, to her house on Aylesboro, where my dad's from, Aylesboro Avenue, when she encountered this dude. And I'm gonna read about her encounter with this dude. When she made a turn onto Murray Avenue, a truck pulled up in front of her. On the side of it were painted three curious words, crosses for losses. As Hepps, rem I hear myself on Zoom. <laughs> As Hepps remembered it, she looked into Greg Zanus's truck and saw a pile of crosses in the back. They were all white, and on a quick count, she decided there were 11 of them. Remember, there had been 11 victims. As soon as she grasped what she was seeing, what he was going to do with the crosses, she was incensed. I thought to myself, you have got to be fucking kidding me, Hepps said. And I looked around and no one else was there. And I thought, if I have to be the one to tell this man he can't put crosses on the synagogue, I will be the one to tell him he can't put crosses on a synagogue. Hepps had no idea who this guy was with this kind of nerve. As she was figuring out what to say to him, trying to keep her cool, she saw on the front seat of his truck a pile of wooden six-pointed stars. She was relieved. I thought, okay, what will happen here is he's gonna put the stars of David on the crosses and it'll be okay. Zanus got out on the driver's side of the truck and approached Hepps. She looked him up and down. He was tired, unshaven, old. What was he doing here? Where had he come from? Then she looked down and saw his hands and it was as if something became clear. I saw his hands were covered in white paint, Hepps remembered. It's like he painted these things overnight and didn't even have time to wash his hands. He told me his intention. He said to me, I made these things, then got in my truck and drove nine hours. There was white paint on his hands. He said to me, I've been driving the whole time. I don't even know the names of the people who died. I have to write their names on the stars. And then Hepps knew what she had to do. Her mother had emailed her the full list of the dead that morning. So she had the names on her phone. Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Malinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, Herb Younger. I brought up this list and he said to me, can you please write the names in my notebook? And he handed me a pen and his notebook and I was shaking as I copied these names into his notebook. I have terrible handwriting. So he could write the names on the stars. When Hepps had written down all 11 names, she gave Zanus's notebook back to him. But now she had a question for him. I said to him, why do you do this? He said there'd been gun violence in his family and this was his response. He said, do you remember Parkland? I did that one. Do you remember Columbine? I did that one too. It had never occurred to me that it was one person who had made it his life's work to drive around the country and do this. And at that moment I realized we are just another one on the list. So that was Greg Zanus, who died last year. I got to interview him before he did, but he had founded Crosses for Losses, his one-man nonprofit, where from the mid-90s on, he put millions of miles on a whole series of pickup trucks that he drove into the ground, driving everywhere there was mass death, both by mass killing or sometimes plane crashes, sometimes homicides, um, uh, spurts of violence, gang warfare. And basically, his life's work was to put crosses where these people were, but he was an evangelical Christian. The cross was his thing, but he was always very sensitive and he would put stars of David on the front if it was Jewish death. He would put a, uh, a crescent moon if it were Muslim death. Um, he, had, he knew the symbols that might be appropriate for Sikhs, Hindus. He even had a symbol he would put on crosses to obscure the cross if, an, if a avowed atheist had died. And I forget what that symbol was, but there's some lapel pin claimed by atheists and agnostics that he knew and that he would make out of, out of wood. So anyway, he, his arrival, the, the, the kind of weird interjection of this strange, curious, trauma tourist, uh, evangelical Christian, but coming with sensitivity to the Jewish death was in some ways typical of the kind of thing that I saw. It was typical in its atypicality. And it's the kind of story that I tell in the book of, of just these interesting ripple effects. With my slides, I wanna start with the cover of the book because right there, the photograph that, that I chose um, is interesting because it's, it's the scene outside Tree of Life within a day or two afterwards. It's night times, probably Sunday or Monday night afterwards. And already you can see in this, um, in this slide, thank you for the dimming, um, the, the, the interfaith nature of the memorial that arose organically because what you see are little tea candles or yard site lights that are very Jewish, but then you also see bouquets of flowers which are not typically a Jewish thing. So it, already you can see that Jews had come and begun the morning in their way and non-Jews, Gentiles, Christians, you know, other allies had come to begin the morning in their way. There's Greg Zanus, 
about whom we just heard. This is not at Tree of Life. This is at a different killing. But you can see that was his, his, uh, his trademark flannel shirt and hard hat. He was a retired carpenter, by the way, a Christian carpenter. They seem to pop up everywhere in world history, those, those <laughs> Christian carpenters who decide they have another calling. Um, and uh, you can see he, he would paint the names on, on the crosses. That was his thing. And of course, now you see crosses popping up everywhere. It's kind of a thing people do after someone dies. But he, he sort of had the trademark on it. Again, maybe he wasn't the first Christian carpenter, but he was, he was in that lineage. Um, one of the other things that I was very interested in was all the different kinds of iconography that happened in the aftermath of a mass killing, all the visual representations. Um, this one uh, is particularly interesting. You've probably all seen this. You've seen it maybe on t-shirts or tote bags or yarmulkes. Uh, maybe you've been to Pittsburgh and seen it in the, the shop windows lining the Forbes and Murray shopping district. Uh, it was created the afternoon of the killing within two or three hours by a uh, German-American lapsed Lutheran named Tim Heinz not Heinz like the ketchup and the stadium in Pittsburgh, but H-I-N-D-E-S, Heindis. Um, he, was a, he is a graphic designer who, um, he didn't know anyone at Tree of Life, not involved in the Jewish community. Again, he's a, a lapsed Lutheran. Um, but he was home, he felt a tug to do something, and he thought, well, I'm, I'm a designer, I should start designing. And he started futzing around on his, uh, his desktop Macintosh and he thought, well, what, you know, I want, to, I want to represent Pittsburgh and how it loves the Jews. So what's more Pittsburgh than the Steelers logo? And he, um, he said, what's more Jewish than a Star of David? Uh, he got some pushback for using a yellow star, which of course has other historical connotations for the Jews, but he, it, it fit within the Steelers logo. Um, there's a door prize if anyone knows what the, do you know what geometric shape that the red and blue things are in the Steelers logo? I had to learn this to write this book. Those are hypocycloids, um, and he replaced, so, the correct discussion of what happens, he replaced the yellow hypocycloid in the Steelers logo with the Star of David, and then he replaced the Steelers with Stronger Than Hate in the, in the logo, and he got this. And he posted it to Facebook, and within hours, it had circled the globe thousands of times. Um, he ended up handing the trademark over to the Steelers on their assurance that they would never profit from it, but they now control the rights to it. And again, this is just like one way that the tragedy became defined by um, the broader community, Gentiles, as much as Jews. And I tracked him down and I interviewed him. Um, and actually his brother wrote to me this morning and said, because um, uh, the story of how he, Tim did this logo was excerpted in Sports Illustrated. And his brother wants to frame it for him, but it's only online. So he said, well, can Sports Illustrated do a like, can they put it in print just for him? And I said, well, magazine publishing doesn't really work that way. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll figure out some way. I hope it's not streaming to his brother. It's supposed to be a surprise. Okay. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. If, don't, if you know Tim Hines, don't tell him he's getting this for his birthday. Um, also speaking of the iconography of it, this, this came out of the killing, uh, the Friday after the killing, the fourth day of the funerals. There were funerals Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We might pause for a moment and think about what it means for a tight-knit, densely packed community of less than three square miles to bury 11 of its own over four days, uh, 11 victims of murder. Um, that's just so, so extraordinary. Um, we could also pause to say that there are other communities that have regular murders, not necessarily 11 at once, but there are communities that are hit by the kind of gun violence that means that there are often regular funerals there as well. And, and in this case, it was the Jews experiencing that sort of week of funerals. Um, the editor-in-chief of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, now the former editor-in-chief, David Shribman, a Bostonian, as it were, um, originally, and former Boston Globe reporter, uh, he wanted to do something special with his headline for that Friday. So he called his rabbi at Temple Sinai, a reformed temple on Forbes Avenue, and he said, can you email me the text of the first line of the Kaddish? And so Rabbi Gibson emailed him this, Yitkadal v'yitkadash me rabbah. And he then decided he was gonna put it into print, but the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette did not have a Hebrew typeface, so the design team had to do some photo photoshopping to figure out how to, how to make this happen. And um, it pretty instantly became one of the classic American newspaper headlines of all time, sort of right up there with Dewey defeats Truman. The star What's more American than Starbucks? Um, this is the Starbucks at the corner of Forbes and Shady. It's the busier of the two Starbucks in Squirrel Hill. And um, the Tuesday after the killing, the lapsed Presbyterian manager of the Starbucks, Melissa Lysot, wanted to do something for her Jewish customers who she felt were really suffering. So she asked a friend of hers who was an artist Nicole Flannery, a Roman Catholic, would you do something Jewish? And she connected with someone who taught her enough Hebrew script to do the words um, ahava, chesed, and tikva, um, love, kindness, and hope in the windows along with a star of David, a tree of life, and a dove. 
And they're still there. I was in Pittsburgh two weeks ago, and I think they'll be there forever. And I sort of love the idea that 50 years from now, teenagers will be having their frappuccinos at the Starbucks on Forbes and say, what's that stuff in the window? And someone will say, well, you know, there was a, there was a shooting nearby once. And the manager of the Starbucks, you know, decided to do this for the, for the Jewish community. Um, this is not a good photograph because I took it. Um, that's why the composition is off, but I, no one else was there. Um, one of the things that happened in the aftermath of the killing was people through a, uh, organized by a Facebook group, people from around the world sent little handmade stars of David to Pittsburgh, um, often made of tinsel paper, foil, uh, glitter paper, sometimes popsicle sticks. They were children's projects. Sometimes they were knit out of yarn. And a group of people in Pittsburgh organized to fan out throughout the city and hang them. This is hanging from the H on the Squirrel Hill sign at the base of Forward Avenue when you get off the freeway and ascend up towards Murray Avenue. And they'd been, up, they'd been put up in November all over the city. And, um, and they survived the winter and then slowly started coming apart because of the snow and the sleet and the elements. And this was the last one that I saw in its natural habitat. And I took a photograph of it. And when I came the next week, it was gone. And it sort of broke my heart. It was like it had fall, you know, fallen to winter. But then I looked on the ground, and it was there. So I, I saved it. I have it. Um, but this is, uh, this is an example of the kind of public art that happens in the aftermath something like this. I love this photograph because as you see the Orthodox men walking behind the hearse, and I don't know which victim's hearse this is, you're reminded of the, again, the intra-faith nature of the grieving process in Pittsburgh, which is quite unusual, this, this level of solidarity. These are Orthodox men and, and a few women following a hearse carrying someone who was not Orthodox because none of the victims was. Um, the three synagogues that lost members, the landlord congregation and the two tenant congregations were an unaffiliated but historically conservative synagogue, a conservative synagogue, and a reconstructionist synagogue. Um, nobody there identified as Orthodox, but the Orthodox felt that you know, they had a role to play as, as shomrim, as people who guarded the bodies, and generally helping out. Um, some of the taharas, the ritual cleansings of the bodies, washings of the bodies before death on some of the victims were performed by the one of the two burial societies, Hever Kaddish's in Pittsburgh, that was more Orthodox and some of the taharas were done by the more liberal and less orthodox Hever Kadisha. By the way, the burial societies could be a book of their own. I mean, what I learned about the work that the Hever Kadishas do and how they do it and the history of it, which I knew vaguely, but hearing this, and they don't advertise themselves. Part of the thing about Hever Kadishas is they're supposed to be kind of a little bit quiet, not secretive, but relatively anonymous. And it's astonishing. Those were absolutely the most intense stories I heard of what these people I mean, one of the people who was buried by the Hever Kadisha had been a member of the Hever Kadisha. And now here they were washing his body. And just like weeks earlier, he'd been washing other bodies with them. And um, by the way, Hever Kadisha literally means holy society, not burial society. And I wish we would start translating it as holy society, because I just think it captures what they do a bit better. Um, one of the other things that happens in the aftermath of a mass killing is that money pours in. From around the world, people want to cut checks or give their credit card to do something. Um, over $7 million was raised for however you want to define it, and this was tricky. Families of the survivors, people who were wounded, victims, victims' families, people who might have been traumatized. There's a whole balagan about how do you decide who gets money when money flows into funds that are set up. But the most lucrative fundraiser, aside from the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, was a single human being, this one guy, uh, Sheikh Khatiri, who is an Iranian uh, ex-Muslim immigrant to America, hopes to be a citizen, um, loves America. When I asked him to send me a photo, it's telling that he sent me a photo of himself holding Plato's Republic standing in front of the White House, just to let you know how he feels about Western civilization. And he, um, he woke up Saturday afternoon a little bit hungover. I, I say he likes, he's trying to drink all the alcohol that the Ayatollahs would have forbidden him. And he um, heard what had happened, and so he, he went to his coffee shop and went on GoFundMe.org and opened up a fund. And then that, that fund page was retweeted by the, the TV anchorman Jake Tapper and other people, and it kind of circled the globe, and he ended up within a week raising something like a million and a half dollars for the victims. Um, some of the people who organized in the aftermath were teenagers. Uh, these are two Alderdice High School seniors. They're now college students, of course. Emily Pressman on the left, she's Jewish. Um, Isabel Smith on the right, uh, black, histor ancestrally Christian, though as she told me, not particularly religious. And they had met at that Starbucks that day and organized a Havdalah, a, a Sabbath-ending vigil for that 
night. And so you can see Emily Pressman holding the Havdalah candle. Um, interestingly, the adults in the community told them not to do it. They said, we're organizing something for tomorrow night, a big event at Soldiers and Sailors Hall on the Pitt campus. Um, we don't, it's too soon to do anything tonight. And the teenagers said, no, we need to do something now. And they organized it themselves. And um, they ended up pulling out about 3,000 people to the corner of Forbes and Murray. Um, I always want people to know that what's not in this photo at the corner of Forbes and Murray um, is uh, Sixth Presbyterian Church, which is just out of the frame, and of course was the house of worship frequented by uh, Fred Rogers, you know him as Mr. Rogers, who of course was a longtime Squirrel Hill resident, um, who when he created a neighborhood that was supposed to represent America's neighborhoods, was looking out his window at Squirrel Hill. Um, and of course taped it at you know, WQED for decades thereafter. So. Um, Literally, this was Mr. Rogers' neighborhood that was, that was affected. Um, people want to not just give money, but they want to come. Everyone wants to come. The president wants to come. And while there was a lot of controversy over the president coming, uh, because some people felt that his rhetoric had perhaps given courage to the kind of anti-Semitic uh, violence that, that had led to this attack, um, he did come. And the rabbi of Tree of Life, Jeffrey Myers, here is meeting with the president and the, the ex-president and ex-first lady. Some people felt the rabbi shouldn't meet with him. And he never explained his reasoning to me. But uh, I think that he ultimately decided, as many people, he agreed with the people who said, you're a rabbi. Your job is to offer hospitality to anyone who comes. I should say, without weighing in on what I would have done in that situation, that I'm very much of the school as a journalist that I'll talk with anybody. You know, when I've sat with you know, Holocaust deniers and neo-Nazis and all sorts of people. And I think, um, I think sometimes that is, the, that is the work that certain people are called to do. You can see they're standing behind um, Greg Zanus's Crosses for Losses, right? Those are the stars of David right there with the name Sylvan Simon, Bernice Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, and Irv Younger on them. So those are five of the 11 crosses with stars of David. The people who thought the president shouldn't come organized a protest. Here they are enacting a, uh, a makeshift version of Korea, the, uh, the Jewish mourning ritual where you tear your garment, or in some cases tear a black ribbon that you've safety pinned to your garment. And here they handed out pieces of black paper, strips of black paper, and they, they went silent. And um, w when a signal was given, they all tore the paper um, in a kind of hushed, sibilant, semi-silent rebuke to, um, to the president. Someone said to me, I think that, that the anti-Trump protest was the largest single gathering of Jews in Pittsburgh history. Um, and while that's impossible to prove, because of course the Trump protests had plenty of non-Jews as well, and you can't really count crowds well, it is entirely plausible that there were several thousand Jews there, and that's more than has ever been fit in one, you know, temple or synagogue or shul in Pittsburgh, at least in the last, you know, number of decades. I mean, that's an entirely plausible claim that Trump united Pittsburgh Jewry in a way that nothing ever had before. Um, not everyone was so subtle about their opposition to the president. Um, this sign was. Uh, was, was an outlier. And I include it here to say that, you know, there was a whole range of ways of responding to Trump's visit, but this was very much an outlier. It was generally peaceful, both in, you know, physically and also kind of spiritually. There was one arrest. This is University of Pittsburgh sociologist Joshua Bloom, who sat down in front of the motorcade and refused to move, started meditating, and was taken away by police, who he says were quite good to him. And he was released the next morning, and no charges were filed. Uh, the president wasn't the only celebrity who came. Um, Tom Hanks, who's now an honorary chairperson of the fundraising effort to renovate Tree of Life, came. And here he has his arm around um, another one of America's first ladies, Joanne Rogers, Mr. Rogers' widow. I think that like Tom, it's, in a way, Tom Hanks and Mrs. Rogers are as much America's first, you know, president and first lady as any other president and first lady, Joe and Jill or, you know, Donald and Melania. I mean, what's more, you know, Hanks and Mrs. Rogers? My goodness, that's, that's powerful stuff. Um, some of you, especially in Greater Boston, will recognize on whose uh, who, who's will recognize that mane of luscious white hair. Um, that is, of course, the head of Robert Kraft, of course, the owner of the New England Patriots, um, who told me when I saw him that his uh, bar mitzvah portion was. I always have trouble pronouncing it. Bahalosacha, right? Bahalotacha, right? And uh, he was very proud that he remembered portions of it. He showed up at Tree of Life um, the day before the Steelers were to play the Patriots. Um, or the Patriots were in town to play the Steelers. He came to, to well, to Rodef Sholem, where Tree of Life has been uh, in residence since the killing. Uh, there was a bar mitzvah there. This was in December. Wait, could it have been in December? Would there still have been a football game on? It was the very end of the season, yeah. So, um, and, um, and he showed up with surprise tickets for the bar mitzvah boy. Um, he also, of course, was wearing that Steelers Stronger Than Hate Star of David Yarmulke, 
which meant that this was the first time surely in human history that the owner of the Patriots was spotted in public wearing the garb of the rival Pittsburgh Steelers. And I felt, although I'm not normally one to snap a photograph in shul, I thought that God wanted me to take a picture of this. So I, I stealthily took out my iPhone and talk, took a picture of that. Um, just seemed important to the historical record. I felt there was like a higher calling in documenting that. Um, and then of course, as I said, it's not only humans who turn out, but a, a lot of people. There, I talked to a woman who brought her, her, her therapy dogs from, um, from New Jersey. Uh, to uh, to Pittsburgh, I mean, eight eight hours or something. Um, so you could see this dog and the dog in the background are both wearing red support animal vests. A lot of dogs were out for hugging. And the point is people gave however they could. If you were a graphic designer, you designed. If you were a challah baker, you baked challah. If you, know, if, if you, were, if you could raise money, you raised money. Um, if Whatever people could do. And if you had dogs to bring out, you brought your dogs out. Um, it's worth looking at this girl's uh, scrawled note, it says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe, Lily, age six. And that's a note she's written for the Pittsburgh police. Um, and I want to end with this photograph of, uh, this is part of the epilogue of my book. This guy had no particular connection to Tree of Life, but insofar as what I was documenting was the many ripple effects of what happens when, when mass killing comes to town, and there have been over 300 mass killings in America since Columbine, the FBI has a definition of mass killing. It's four or more killed in one criminal act. And there have been over 300 of them. It's astonishing to think, right? Um, college seniors today were born in 1999 and have never lived in a time when there weren't weekly and, you know, monthly and even weekly mass killings in America. Um, and the ripple effects are profound. They're not just on the victims or the surviving family members. This guy, Robert Zacharias, grew up, lives uh, in the east end of Pittsburgh, near Squirrel, Squirrel Hill, grew up in a um, you know, fairly reform home in New Jersey, has always been a little bit of a spiritual seeker, but by no means highly observant. Um, and I just want to conclude by reading you a little bit of what happened to him uh, in the aftermath of the killing. The morning of the shooting, Zach, his name is Robert Zacharias, but he goes by Zach. Zach had been hanging out with a friend at her apartment in Bloomfield, northwest of Squirrel Hill. After getting the news, Zach went home. He checked in with his family and friends, and a couple hours later, in mid-afternoon, he went to the Giant Eagle supermarket to buy soup and yardside candles, small candles, one lights to honor the dead. Before he left, he dug into his closet for one of his yarmulkes. He put it on and left for the market. It was the first time he'd ever worn a yarmulke when it wasn't Shabbat, a Jewish holiday, or some other special occasion. Zach kept the yarmulke on his head at the Havdalah planned by the Alderdice students. He has been wearing one ever since. It is a new experience for me to be wearing a yarmulke out in the world on a regular basis, Zach said. It has these interesting implications. He mentioned a night when he and his girlfriend had been trying to decide where to go out to eat. I was like, well, Gooskies is open. And then I was like, but I heard they have some Nazis at Gooskies. Zach was referring to the rumor that at some point, some sort of neo-Nazi punk band had played a gig at Gooskies, a small dive bar in the Polish Hill neighborhood. Zach figured the rumor was probably false, but his head was spinning with possibility. He'd thought about the overlap between punks, many of whom lived in Polish Hill, and various strains of white nationalist ideology. And then he realized that if there were neo-Nazis hanging out at Gooskies, he now looked like a target. But I didn't want to take my yarmulke off to go to Gooskies and have dinner, he said. That didn't feel right. That's some kind of bizarre paying of obeisance to the ghost or not ghost Nazis, and I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to not go to Gooskies if I want to go to some neighborhood bar and get vegan kielbasa. The yarmulke complicated everything. If he took off the yarmulke, the neo-Nazis, real or imagined, would win. If he kept the yarmulke on but skipped Gooskies, the neo-Nazis, real or imagined, would still win by depriving him of tasty vegan kielbasa. But if he said yes to the yarmulke and to Gooskies, he put his newly visibly Jewish self in sight of the real or imaginary neo-Nazis. To be clear, I researched this, and there's no evidence that there were ever neo-Nazis at Gooskies. Urban legend. Zach weighed his options, screwed up his courage, and took himself and his girlfriend to Gooskies. When he stepped inside, he took a look around, and his first thought was, these are not people who want to hurt me. These aren't anti-Semitic people here. He saw a coworker at the bar reading the New York Times app on his iPhone as he drank a beer and smoked a cigarette. It was all copacetic. But the yarmulke was not finished with him yet. He and his girlfriend sat at the bar and placed their orders. I made a very expensive order by mistake, he said. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't get all that. 
He turned away from the bar to look at his menu to figure out what to order instead. And as he turned away, he noticed the bartender noticing his yarmulke. And then he immediately was concerned that she would see his changing his order as a manifestation of his Jewishness. I was like, oh, God damn it, now I'm a money-grubbing Jew. Like, I'm complaining about the expensive order and adjusting my order to be less expensive. So I felt bad about that because now I'm a symbol of all the Jews. Zach was still feeling like the guy in a yarmulke who had flagged a problem with his restaurant tab when something compounded his misstep. He lifted his bottle of yingling to his mouth to have a sip, and a bit of it sloshed out and landed on a man sitting next to him at the bar. It was just a tiny bit of beer, and it seemed that the man didn't notice. So Zach elected not to say anything. I thought, oh, he doesn't notice, doesn't matter. But no sooner had Zach elected to let the matter drop than the man turned around. He had noticed. Zach quickly apologized, hoping to make everything right, but it was too late. I was like, I'm sorry, I spilled some beer on you, but I said it after I'd already spilled it. So yet again, I think like, now I'm a jerk, a selfish, unapologetic Jew person. So it's even worse, everything is bad. He threw up his hands in despair. A public Jew can never win. So I, I closed the, the book with that anecdote, more or less, there's a few paragraphs after that, because again, I really didn't want to point out that a mass killing, as terrible as it is, as horrible as it is, isn't just this terror and horror. It's a lot of things. It's a terror and horror that goes on for people who, who can't forget, who can't sleep. I talked to one woman whose child had, had worn a Star of David necklace and never wanted to wear it again um, after that because of fear of, of, of the neo-Nazis, right? Um, and that goes on and doesn't get reported. But so too do these, do these extraordinary kind of ripples and emanations. I mean, so too does, does the Muslim exchange student raise over a million dollars for the Jews. You know, so too does a guy put on a yarmulke. And, and I, by the way, he was in Pittsburgh two weeks ago at my book signing there and with the same girlfriend and the same yarmulke. So, I mean, it's like interesting, just interesting how these things carry on. So too do some people who were thinking about converting to Judaism decide to convert because of what happened. And they feel like, well, this is my tribe. And it's, it's like, I'm in, am I in or am I out? And ultimately, you know, to me, this, this book is a story of all of these little stories that really make up the bigger story of how a neighborhood as an organism can come through something like this and, and not only survive, but also in some ways thrive. So thank you very much. You want the microphone? <laughs> Let me just steal the microphone for a second. Uh, the we have a question that came in in the chat actually ahead of time oh. that I think is still really valid and really important. This is from uh, Marty Willis, who I think is the Marty Willis who I went through elementary school with and all the way through high school. Um, he didn't ans answer that question back. But um, he wants to know, in what ways is this unique? Is, what ways is this pits is, was Squirrel Hill unique before this happened? And in what ways is this response unique to some dynamic that's in Squirrel Hill? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so the, um, let me say a little about, about Squirrel Hill and I'll say a little bit about, about American mass killings because there are two parts to that answer. I'll go, actually I'll go in the other order. American mass killings actually very seldom hit um, coherent, groups of victims. Um, we know when they do, when it's a bunch of uh, six-year-olds murdered in Newtown, which by the way, haunts me much more than any American mass killing does. Maybe because I live 20 miles from Newtown, maybe because it was first graders, or was it second graders? I can never remember, but it was, I, anyway, because I whatever it was, I had a daughter that age at the time. That one like lives inside me, I can't even imagine. But, um, but most mass killings are not, you know, the elementary school class, who, where the parents know each other through the PTA. They're not the shul where people have been worshiping together and their families know each other and most of them live fairly nearby and many of them are multi-generational Pittsburghers. Most of them are visited on people who have only in common that they all went to the mall that day or something like that or the movie theater. And that's a particularly terrible fate because what it means is these families who have in common, who may live in a, in a circumference of like 100 miles from you know, the point of the killing and who have nothing in common then have to negotiate the aftermath and the money and the grief and the media 
with no foundation of mutual understanding or support or with no prior existing relationships. So in that respect, Squirrel Hill, the, you know, the Tree of Life and the three congregations there is in a small, but dare I say it, relatively fortunate subgroup of mass killing sites in that they had social capital and prior, prior existing relationships that allowed them to, to work together. And that by the way, um, meant that the sort of uh, excess psychic damage that often goes on where the families end up in mutual recriminations and feeling that their money wasn't fairly distributed and survivor's guilt and hatred, the acrimony that can sometimes exist did not tend to visit the survivor community of Squirrel Hill. So in that sense, they were they are part of a small but fortunate subgroup in that they had prior existing relationships, which is not the rule. The other thing I'll say is I do think, and I have a whole chapter on this, that Squirrel Hill has some unique advantages in being a not only sort of having good topography, being like dense and walkable and, and people see each other. It has a, a business worship and educational district where everything you could want, your shuls, your schools, secular and, and Jewish day schools, your kosher market, your bookstore, your post office, your public high school, your supermarket are all, can, can, you can hit them all within a 10 or 15 minute walk. And just the fact that people saw each other, that people weren't as isolated as they would have been if they'd lived in kind of suburban or exurban sprawl um, is a huge advantage. The two other things I would add is that I do think, although I haven't established this statistically, that uh, Squirrel Hill has an unusual number of intergenerational, or excuse me, multi-generational families. That is to say, people who live there, whose parents live there, and in many cases, grandparents and great-grandparents. Um, and I also think the fact that it is the home for different kinds of Jewry who have a history of cooperation was also very fortunate. So I think it has certain advantages that we can look at and, and possibly learn from and take lessons from. Any other questions? We have a microphone going around if anyone has anything else I can tell you. Because I haven't even scratched the surface of all the things I want to tell you about. What else? Yeah, I literally have answered every question people have about. What, can I ask, is anyone here from Pittsburgh? I told you, it's, I told Ruth, it's my superpower. I bring out Pittsburghers wherever I go. I was in Western Massachusetts not long ago, and there were four people out of an audience of 30, maybe it's five, who are all from Pittsburgh, and didn't all know that each other were from Pittsburgh, even though they knew each other in the community. I mean, it really is, it really is kind of a special thing. I don't know, I mean, yeah, question? No, it's not a question, it's just a statement. I grew up in Squirrel Hill. Um, I, oh, sorry, I grew up in Squirrel Hill, and I think a lot of the things you hit upon in your book, I mean, I can just say that even, I haven't lived in Squirrel Hill in, since the 80s, and, um, but it's, it's a very tight-knit community, and even when you leave Pittsburgh, people from Pittsburgh and Squirrel Hill reconnect with one another in wherever, whatever communities they're living in now, so. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that I think that I've learned as I've met people in the Squirrel Hill diaspora is um, that First of all, if you think that you know someone from Pittsburgh, wherever you are outside of Pittsburgh, it's probably because you do, because Pittsburgh lost half its population in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So in fact, the Pittsburgh diaspora is enormously large, um, especially relative to the size of Pittsburgh. It's not that big a city, but it's not as if that, the percentage of Pittsburgh, or of Pittsburgh in 1975 that is now in the Pittsburgh diaspora is much higher than the percentage of Boston or Los Angeles or whatever that's in those diasporas. So it actually is a common thing to meet ex-Pittsburghers and it feels more common than you would expect given um, how small it is. And I think that's really neat. The other thing I would say is that even though Pittsburghers will generally deny it, they are fundamentally Midwesterners, which means they're nice. And, and I know they deny it. And actually, I have a whole, a little meaty footnote of my book about this debate. Um, because you know, they deny it in terms that are so sweet and gentle that it only proves the point that they're Midwesterners. Um, their denials do not have the ring of sort of Boston or New York denial. So, um, but, but you know, that's in, a, that's, in a, that's in a good way, which is that they are, you know, they tend to connect with each other in the diaspora. They, are, they do have a fundamental decency and a warmth. And um, they tend to speak of the positive from their hometown, not the negative. There's a kind of loyalty there. I mean, I always say, you know, except for Princeton alumni, Pittsburghers are the most irrationally loyal people you'll ever meet. I mean, they just, it's, it borders on an obsession. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm neither Princetonian nor a Pittsburgher. I'm just, it's pure journalistic objectivity, so. I have a question over here. Ac across the aisle. We want to get to Zoom land. That's why we need the microphone. 
Hello, old friend, Professor Sugarman. Great to see you. Um, you as well. So um, I, I've been following your work for a long time, and, and you, you have a, a real eye for history and the present. And it just coincidentally, I, my brother and his family now live in Squirrel Hill, and I was just there last weekend. Um, and I was struck by how different that Jewish community is in its geography, that my experience of, of living in other cities is that Jews live in a city until the 1950s, and then they leave and they go to suburbs. And Squirrel Hill is relatively unique in that it still is urban. The Jews have lived there continuously for a, for a century, and it seems to be a different kind of Jewish community that didn't flee to, mm -hmm. for example, Newton from, from Dorchester. I mean, Boston's history of its Jewish community was mm -hmm. an urban Jewish community, and then, you know, like many others. So what, what yeah. do you, what's your lesson, or what's your sense of the history of that question. community and why? So there, um, one of the things I write in the book is everyone has a theory on that, which means that nobody really knows. When everyone has, when there are 15 Regnan theories, it means nobody really knows. Um, the first thing to say is that, you know, Squirrel Hill has changed. One thing that's happened, it's become more orthodox, um, but, but not overwhelmingly more orthodox. And a lot of the orthodox are in adjacent neighborhoods like Greenfield. And in the book, I'm very careful to talk about the east end of Pittsburgh. You know, actually most people in, Pittsburgh actually has a meaningful neighborhood map. They're actually, Pittsburgh draws boundaries and says, this is Squirrel Hill. This is Regent Square. This is there is a there is an actual juridical definition which most Pittsburghers don't know. So, for example, they will tell you that Carnegie Mellon is in Oakland, but it's not. It's in it's in Squirrel Hill, whereas Pitt is in Oakland. You know, um, and Rodef Sholem is not in Squirrel Hill. It's in Shady Side because it's across Fifth Avenue. So, I mean, if you want to to get like prissy and mockmere about it, um, it is it is worth saying that we're talking about a bunch of neighborhoods of which Squirrel Hill is is central, but there are others, and they're all contiguous and walkable. Um, you know, among the theories out there are number one, that there was, um, uh, it was never redlined in the way that some neighborhoods were. There was never kind of government suborned blockbusting or, um, you know, bad urban renewal there. The government was, was more benign in how it treated this neighborhood because of accidents of history than others. Um, another one is, somebody said that, one guy said, it may be that Squirrel Hill, um, because Pittsburgh's always 10 or 20 years behind the curve, by the time the bad news about cities got to Pittsburgh, the good news about the reurbanization of cities had come back around. <laughs> and there's actually not, it's actually not crazy that, you know, in the in the 80s and 90s, it's like there, there was not the kind of, you know, crack epidemic in the urban core of Pittsburgh that there was in, say, Hartford. And people kind of stayed. They didn't. They weren't as aware that people had already f fled the, the urban cores of Cleveland and Detroit, let's say. And then by the time you get to the 90s, all of a sudden, like cities are hip again, and the yuppies want to move in. And it, you, his theory was that somehow the white flight sort of passed Pittsburgh by. They didn't catch up in time. Um, but the main thing that I would just say that that we can all that we can certainly agree on is there was a, a real effort to keep the institutions, the Jewish institutions, in Squirrel Hill um, when they when all the institutions were 75 to 100 years old in the 90s. Um, they either had to be renovated or they had to rebuild in the suburbs. And what a lot of cities had done with their Jewish community center, their Jewish home for the aged, Jewish family services, the Jewish day school, is instead of renovating these institutions in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, they rebuilt them in suburbs. And in Squirrel Hill. Jewish leaders and some non-Jewish leaders got together and said, let's raise a lot of money and renovate them right here. And they did, which meant, and they basically were making a gamble, which is if we keep the institutions here, Jews will keep coming here. And as it happens, like that kind of worked. So it was partially a result of a whole bunch of, of luck, but it was also partially um, the result of some really intentional um, urban planning um, and, and willfulness. I will also add that to the extent that Jews as mostly white identified people have historically fled black neighbors, Pittsburgh has fewer black neighbors. Pittsburgh is a very white city. Um, the, the black population in Pittsburgh is substantially smaller than in Cleveland, Detroit, um, uh, and other Chicago and other cities. Um, as a result, there, if you were sort of looking at it, one of the things that causes white Jews to flee 
neighborhoods is often the sense that black neighbors will come and lower property values. That pressure was felt less in Squirrel Hill and other white neighborhoods of Pittsburgh. So that's probably, alas, also a factor. But it's a lot of little things, I think. Yeah. We have a couple questions that have been coming in through the chat. Great. In this, from our Zoom audience. Uh, so first from Nancy Netzer, who is, uh, I don't know whether you met her, but mm. she directs the McMullen Museum of Art here at, B at Boston College, also a Pittsburgher. Um, so those who lived in Squirrel Hill, at least until October 2018, have felt protected in their community. Have you perceived that that feeling has changed? And if so, how? So the first thing I should say on that is, again, I left when COVID came as it, you know, coincidentally and have and been, been back only once since. So I have not, if, you know, whatever the feeling is, if it's changed in the past year and a half or so, um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, my general sense of Jewish communities everywhere is that, um, you know, tragedy makes people more themselves. So people who tend towards fear and alarmism, often for good reason, um, are confirmed in those fears. And people who tend not to have that particular anxiety about um, about bodily safety tend to reset to their kind of norm pretty quickly. I mean, we know this about grief, for example. Most people reset to whatever their baseline temperament is relatively quickly after losing a loved one. And I think the same thing was kind of true here, um, which is that people who are inclined to feel unsafe in their Jewish spaces probably feel more so, and people who feel safe there, I think often go on feeling pretty um, safe. I do want to make, you know, from my own point of view, I always want to make clear that even though I've now written a book about the mass killing of Jews in America, I think Jews are extremely safe in America. I think the mass killing of Jews in America is exceedingly rare. We're a country of over 300 million people that has had, um, you know, one killing like this, and then a bunch of smaller ones, but very few smaller ones in American history. And there are few Jewish communities in the history of the world as safe as the contemporary American Jewish community. And I think that the um, the rush to sort of securitization and to spend money often on security consultants and hardening our borders or our walls or whatever, I think a lot of that money is misspent. Um, I think a lot of it is badly spent. And I think that um, the kind of general culture, which is not just Jewish but secular, of terrifying children with lockdown drills, the chances of, you know, that they'll ever, the chances of, you know, of which the chances they'll ever be useful are, are statistically nil, is a very, very bad trend in contemporary society. So I want to always want to say, I do, I, am, I do not want to be used in the sort of the cult of securitization and lockdown, because I think that's a bad, a bad trend, and I'm against it. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm also from uh, Squirrel Hill and um, actually was about mitzvah at Tree of Life. And Amazing. Family are still members there. And one of the things that I know they're grappling with and just would love to hear your perspective is what, how do you see the future unfolding? Because that building has still been vacant and it's uh, a lot of turmoil about how to move forward. What do you hear? Uh, I hear they're raising money. They've got an architect, and they're you know, trying to figure out what to do with the building. And so my sister's on the, the board there. But I mean, it's really um, an overwhelming thing, I think, yeah. for the whole community. Of I mean, forward. yeah, I would definitely say the tensest moments in my books are either you know, one or two tense moments around how to talk about gun control, because some people in the community feel this is all about gun control, and some don't, politically speaking. And and the other kind of tensest moment is around you know what to do with the building, where they're is, um, as you know, there are different schools of thought, and there are some people who say, you know, the congregation has been shrinking rapidly for a couple decades. Um, you know, and the past three years have not brought a renew, an, an, a, an, an inrush of new members, which surprised me. I thought actually, I thought a couple hundred Jews in Pittsburgh would take out a membership in Tree of Life just because, and uh, they didn't. And so, um, and the building was already much bigger than they needed. And so there are definite, you know, there are a lot of schools of thought. If you talk to people off the record, um, sell the building. You know, it's it's a ten million dollar piece of land, perhaps. I'm just making that number up, but it's a big piece of land in a really prime space. And then you could endow your small congregation forever, and they could move into a nice house. Um, some people said, you know, clean up the mess and um, scrub the floors, and we have to get right back in and and daven and worship because that's how you show the terrorists that they didn't win. Other people said the opposite. We could never pray in that building again unless it's completely reconfigured. 
The, the plan they seem to have come up with is something like we're going to have a reconfigure it heavily. There'll be a worship space, but also a memorial to the victims, but also a Holocaust Remembrance Center, but also a Museum of Tolerance. And, and it's going to take a lot of money to do all that. And there definitely are many schools of thought on whether if there's $10 million in this current economy to be spent in Jewish Pittsburgh, whether that's the best use of it, and whether anyone will come. Um, I'm not a stakeholder in that community, and I always want to be very clear about that. I do think that if the plan was to get back in and pray, it probably would have worked better if as soon as the police tape came down, they rushed back in and started praying, even if it was a mess, even if you have to, like Mother Emanuel in Charleston, they went back in that week. And in Israel, as numerous people pointed out to me, they said, in it, I mean, I don't know if this is true or just apocryphally stated, but like if there's a bombing in the morning, you sweep up and you put the cafe tables out in the afternoon, that like you, you, you keep on keeping on. And there was something very American about the, this kind of paralysis that set in. A lot of committees were formed, a lot of listening sessions, nobody wanted to offend anyone, and as a result, the building is still completely unused for anything three years later, and I don't see that changing in the next five years or so. So it's, 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 a, it's an issue. Thank you. Yeah, sir. I shouted out. No, wait, your microphone's coming. I just don't remember. What happened to the perpetrator? The perpetrator, again, the alleged perpetrator, I want to be clear, um, my wife being a criminal defense attorney, um, was, um, was shot by police in the act, not before he'd shot a couple of police officers, I should say, uh, and apprehended, uh, treated, and, and put in custody, and is still in custody awaiting trial. And the last I heard, the trial was kicked back to next summer. But that's an ongoing thing, as these things are. So um, yeah, they apprehended someone who is, who is in custody. And you know, the Trump Department of Justice was going to go for the death penalty. I don't know if the Biden DOJ will. I don't know if Merrick Garland wants to seek the death penalty. When a, when a mass killing happens in a house of worship, it, it federalizes the crime, so it kicks over to DOJ from the state authorities. So it's up to the Biden administration what sentencing they'd want to ask for, and, and therefore whether there's a possible plea deal. We have another question that came in over Zoom uh, from Olga Turcott and who is not somebody I know this time, at least I don't think so. Um, and I'm gonna reshape your question a little bit because you partially just answered it by pointing to the plans for the building itself. Um, so she's asked whether the people you interviewed or talked to for the book, um, how informed were they regarding Kristallnacht or, such, some, or similar pogroms? And I think the question is also how quickly did the the idea arise of turning Tree of Life into a museum for larger tragedies, basically? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think it's different. I think person by person is different. I think some people very much see this in a terms, and I, this is probably has to do with their personalities and their own backgrounds. Some people see this in a kind of a grand historical sweep. Um, some people see it as, um, as a one-off and see it highly in very personal terms. Um, you know, one person in the Orthodox community said to me, and this is in the book, said, you know, especially to, in modern Orthodox, Zion, in, in Orthodox Zionist, religious nationalist circles, the Orthodox were very attuned to Israel. He said, we're always aware of bombings in Israel. We're aware of kidnappings in Israel. We have a, a, a yearly diet, maybe not a daily diet, but a yearly or biannual diet of something terrible happening to people who are often our cousins who have made Aliyah move to Israel. Like, to us, this is part of the, the, the sweep of being Jewish today. Um, you know, what happens in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Netanya and Pittsburgh is all part of this beautiful but sometimes dangerous landscape of being a Jew. And therefore, he was saying, for we were a little less alarmed and perhaps a little less shaken and a little more capable of dealing um, than perhaps people who were highly Americanized in their Jewish outlook. And I think that's there's some truth to that as well. In terms of what to do with the building, I mean, look, it's an American impulse to always want to turn anything into a, a museum or a memorial. Um, and I think it was inevitable that some people, I mean, one of the things they did was they got the Holocaust Museum or Remembrance Center or Historical Center, I forget what it is, of Pittsburgh, to agree that if they rebuilt Tree of Life with office space, that that center would move into Tree of Life from whatever rented space they have now. So, but you know, I mean, here's the thing, like, I think a lot of people don't necessarily want a Dovin next to a museum to the dead. I mean, it's, it's there is a school of thought that these are at cross purposes. What? 
Yeah, you have a Holocaust, right, exactly, your, your Torah from the Holocaust. I mean, this is, you know, this is a dangerous or an interesting and difficult and conflicted dance of like, how much do we want to memorialize tragedy versus how much do we want a religion that actually theologically is supposed to celebrate life? Um, so, yeah. And, and you know, if it becomes, a, the definition of a successful museum is one where there are constantly school buses of children coming, which isn't necessarily what you want for your regular worship space. Anyway. This has been great. Thank you so much. So I'm supposed to be saying that. Oh, you say that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stand here. I'm going to stand here and sip my Coke, and you can say how great this was. <laughs> so thank you so much, Mark, for bringing us into your world as, as a journalist, bringing us into the world that I think maybe 50% of those of us in the room have some connection <laughs> to, at least, um, of uh, you know, childhood homes in Pittsburgh, a city who which even though we have left, we love. Uh, and um, I really want to encourage those of you who do not yet own the book, there are copies in the back that we would be quite happy for you to be able to buy at a discount. Uh, those of you on Zoom, I'm sure we can get a discount link for you also. Um, and the a reminder that the video of this event will be up on our on their center's website and YouTube channel once it's been edited and prepared to be, uh, to be viewable nicely. Uh, so we also have refreshments in the back that we would much prefer to ha see in people's stomachs than anywhere else. So please help yourselves and uh, choose a, find a chance to introduce yourself to fellow Pittsburghers or wannabe <laughs> Pittsburghers. Uh, so thank you so much thank for you. joining us thank tonight. You.